and um, we'll go from the current slide. Okay. Is how you're entering things on your calculator. You see what you're telling your calculator to do is take nine and subtract. Remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Okay. You're telling it to take nine and subtract from that 1.73 divided by 81, which is a very small number. Okay. And then subtracting from that number, three. Now, is that what you want? Or don't you want it to do parentheses 9 minus that parentheses divided by parentheses that minus this. That's what you're trying to get it to do. Uh, isn't it? Don't you want the difference between here divided by the difference there? Right? And that's why you always ask yourself, does this answer make sense? This is something on the order, like I said, of 7 divided by something on the order of 70. 7 divided by 70 can't possibly be 6. So you see this answer, though you entered the numbers just like that, you didn't put your grouping symbols on. So it's, it's doing what you're telling it to, but it's not what you want it to do. You see, you want it to subtract those two first, subtract those two, then divide this answer by that answer, right? Okay. Okay. All right. I haven't started the rec yes, I have started the recorder. So sorry, all that was recorded. Okay. Um, I can't think of any new announcements. Um, there is one that's more personal, not uh, school-wide, but there is something coming up school-wide. We're supposed to be working on summer schedule, and it sounds like they're screwing up the schedule something terribly this summer. Uh, and I've been trying to get an accurate reading for weeks now, and I talked with my boss this morning and said, look, we need to know before, because they say Scheduled to do March 1st, which is next Sunday. Why would you have scheduled due on a Sunday? He said, well, then it'd be Monday. I said, but, okay, how many weeks are we teaching? You know, what they told us, keep the schedule you had for last summer, which was a 10-week, but we're only going to teach it for eight weeks. I said, that's not enough hours. Well, just give extra assignments. I said, well, that's not teaching. And uh, so I can't get them to, to come up with any, uh, they, as far as I know, they haven't even made a decision, but schedules are still due by next Sunday. So I, if you're expecting to see the summer schedule, you won't see mine because I haven't been able to find out what it's going to be yet, okay? Now, that was one thing. Second thing. And I need to be here next Friday to work on those, but I'm not, okay? I uh, had a nine, more than a nine and a half hour Friday last Friday, and I'm supposed to have four hour Fridays, and so I need to take this Friday off, and I've been given permission to have it off, so I will not be on Birmingham campus again this Friday. Sorry about that. I'm sorry about that because I won't be there to do some of the things I need to do, but uh, because I was gone last Friday all day, I couldn't get some things done I needed to do, and so we're going to have to be gone this Friday. So anyway, that's that. Any questions on anything we've done so far? Um, summer, fall, spring, now, math, calculus, whatever. Any questions? All right, where we're leading off today is where we left off last time is uh, we had done example one, which was the gear problem, okay? And that, they say they illustrates the simple case of the chain rule. The general rule is stated in the next theorem. And frankly, I can see 
by a stretch how that illustrated the chain rule, but it was really a pretty sorry illustration in my mind. Uh, to me, it was almost more complicated than it was worth. Here's the chain rule. If y is equal to some function of some variable, they put u in here. doesn't matter what it is. y is some function of u. That is a differentiable function of that variable u. But the variable u is also a differential function of the variable x, a different differentiable function, g of x. Okay? Then y is equal to f of, but u is g of x, so this is a composite function. And this also is differentiable. If f is differentiable, and g is differentiable, then f of g is differentiable now of x, because that's the innermost independent variable. u is sort of an intermediate variable. And here's what that differential is. dy dx is equal to dy du times du dx. Okay? Where, and I'll tell you in a minute how I would Oh, yeah, they're going to say it down here. Or equivalently, d by dx, is what I find to say, of f of g of x, which is what we're doing, that's your y, is derivative of f as a function of g of x, okay? As a function of u, basically, which is what they're saying here, then times g prime, g is derivative of g, okay? These are letters on the board and blah, 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 and words. When you actually do them, I hope they will make a bit more sense to you. And it'll make, it'll seem, uh, hopefully, if not obvious, a bit more obvious. And cows here. All right. All right, we now have half the class here. Hopefully some more will be coming in. All right. Yeah. When applying the chain rule, it is helpful to think of the composite function alpha g as having two parts, which is how we always think of composite functions. You have an inner part, g, and an outer part, f. <coughs> so y is equal to f of g of x. That's exactly what we have here which is f of this intermediate variable u, where g of u is equal to g of x. The derivative of y equal f of u is the derivative of the outer function at the value of the inner function u times then, on the other previous page, times the derivative of the inner function u prime. But if you're going to put f prime here, why don't you put g prime there? That to me makes more sense. Okay? Whereas u is the value of g at the value x. Okay? And again, I think what she. Oh, Carla slipped in. Okay. Glad you're here. And now more than half the students here. Okay. So this is the representation of the chain rule. Now, let me just say this while people are catching up a little bit. The chain rule is probably, in my mind, the most powerful rule of integration you'll run into. Okay? I mean, differentiation. The product rule you use a lot. The quotient rule you use as little as possible. <laughs> no, I mean, you can use uh, the power rule. All these you use a lot. But, man, the chain rule is always there and it's a pretty to me it makes sense of course I've been doing it for years but once you get the hang of it hopefully you'll see it it goes pretty smoothly okay so get ready and get practicing on the chain rule because it is a very valuable tool incredibly very valuable throughout the course. 
Later when you get into integration, you'll have to think of the chain rule backwards and undo the chain rule. That gets to be a little tricky. So the, the, the more you can be familiar with the chain rule going this way in differentiation, the easier your task will be when you're doing integration, which is taking in reverse. Got it? Okay. So here's example two. All right. Here is your function y is equal to f of g of x. Okay. Now, <clears throat> frankly, well, leave that alone. If you're, <laughs> let me get my pen set up. To me, this isn't the best example in the world, but it's certainly a, a reasonable example. Uh, you can think of this as composite of two functions. Okay? First, the polynomial function, the binomial function, and the denominator, that would be your innermost function, your g, okay, which they are calling u, which is fine, u, u of x. And then the outer function is your reciprocal function. 1 over u, okay? So, thinking of it in that way, okay, now notice what we're not doing. We're not doing the quotient rule, which we could be doing. But, even worse than that, I mean, better than, well, whatever, we're not doing the power rule, which you could be doing, and I'll show you that in a minute. It does use the chain rule as well, but it would be a far better it would be how I work the problem, not this way. But anyway, let's do it. So what would be y prime then? According to what we just talked about with the chain rule. What would be y prime? I assume that's what they're doing here. I mean, I didn't even turn the page. All they're doing is decomposing. I'm sorry. They're not taking the derivatives. All they're doing is decomposing, and they're doing it all for you. Boo hiss. Okay. We just talked through this. We've just decomposed it. We aren't taking a, chain, uh, a derivative of it. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but <clears throat> does that make sense? And again, I wouldn't say this is the easiest way to do it. Here's how I would do it, frankly. Okay? I would say the, I would start with the, I would rewrite this function. x plus 1 to the minus 1. Okay? And then I would say the inner function is the inner function, x plus 1, and the outer function would be u to the minus 1. That's how I would do the problem. And it would be so much in my mind, more straightforward, okay? But the way they did it is perfectly fine, okay? Uh, but just remember, you can do it that way as well, okay? So let's do the B part, and I'm going to try to cover as much as I can. All right, now, what to you is the inner function, your U or G in this case? 2x, exactly. That's the innermost piece. What would be the outer function? Sine. sine. The sine function. Sine of u, where u was 2x. Pretty straightforward, huh? All right. This was also okay. I would have found it far more reasonable to write it this way, and then it's obvious that's the inner function, that is the outer function. Okay. Do the C one. Whoa! What you think the inner function is there? 3x minus 3x plus 1. 3x squared minus x plus 1. That's the innermost function. Your u, your g of x. And the outer function? The square root function. Square root of u. Perfect. 
perfect. Y'all are knocking this down really well. Okay, how about D? What to you is the innermost function there? Say again? The tangent function, absolutely. You're reading the book well. No, 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 okay. That's your innermost function, your u or your g. What's the outer function? The squaring function, u squared. Perfect, perfect. Got it down. All right. Now that we've done that and just talked about decomposing a composite function, let's turn around and actually use the chain rule to do... Whoa! <laughs> the important slide, they left off. Okay. Example three was actually using the chain rule. So let's do it here. Okay. Here's your function. Y is equal to... Y... Oh, I can't write. X squared... plus 1 cubed. Okay? Now, if you wanted to, you could go through all the mess we were just doing up there. Or, if you're okay with it, we can just take it as it is. Okay? If you have y is equal to f of g of x, just like we got here, then what does that imply y prime is? They're calling it dy dx, same answer. Okay, what would that be? How did the chain rule go? Go back and see. Say again? Okay. All right. Close, but not quite. Okay, let's go back and, and see. It's, oh, here it is at the bottom. It's the outer function, the derivative of the outer function evaluated at the inner function, then times the derivative of the inner function. Right? Okay, so let's go and do that. What is the... Okay. Let's do what I think you were saying. U is equal to x squared plus 1, and then your y was what? The cubing function, uh, u cubed. Everybody agree on that one? Okay. So dy dx is, this is why I sort of didn't like their order here. You first take the, it, okay, time out. It doesn't matter what order you do this, because these things are multiplied. Multiplication is commutative. So it really doesn't matter which order you do it. Okay? The way they've written it is this. The outer function. And here's how I think of it. 3, just like a power rule, right? 3 times x squared plus 1. That's the inside, right? And then how does the power rule go? What do you do to the outside? What do you do to your exponent there? Reduce it by 1, making it squared. Then you multiply that by what? Derivative of the inner. What's the derivative of the inner? It's 2x. Perfect. Okay. That's it. Derivative of the outer function, 3 times what's inside, x squared plus 1, drop back by 1, squared, then times the derivative of the inner function. Okay. Now, if you combine all that together, here's what you get. 6x times x squared plus 1 squared. There is the derivative dy dx. Okay. 
Now, just to let you know what you did here, your u prime here, mixing up our notations here, is 2x, and your y prime here, remember as a function of u, was what? You tell me. 3 u squared. But u is x squared plus 1. So the derivative of the outer is 3 times u squared times the derivative of the inner, 2x. And then when you combine, or when you multiply through, 3 times 2 is 6, x times 1 is x, and then this thing is like out there. Okay? You see how it works? Now, if you wanted to, perfectly legitimate to do u prime times f prime of u. If you prefer to do it that way, it's fine. You don't have to do derivative of the outer first and then derivative of the inner. Multiplication is commutative. It doesn't matter which order. If you did it that way, the u prime would have been 2x times the derivative of the outer function, which is 3, and then the u is x squared plus 1 squared. Okay? And when you do that, you get 6x times x squared plus 1 squared. Same answer, okay? Now, is it necessary to expand this and multiply through? No! No reason. Extra work, if you're really hard working and you just want something else to do, work no problems, you know, don't spend, waste your time expanding that. That's a perfectly legitimate, concise way to express your answer, okay? I say that, how did the book do it? Oh, look at them. 6x times x squared plus 1 squared. Yep, that's how they left it. Okay? Does that make sense? Yay or nay? Yes. Looking like maybe no. All right. Perhaps if we did the general power rule, that will give it because that's exactly what we used here. That's what I was suggesting we use up there, okay? So let's go on and do the general power rule, and we'll do some more examples. And hopefully the more you do of these, the more you'll say, oh, okay, I'm beginning to see what's happening. So let's see. Here is a function. Y is equal to some U of X. We were calling that g of x before. I don't know why they've changed. Raised to the nth power. It's one of the most common types of composite functions. Okay? Jermaine, what? Okay. Okay. We're on, in Chapter 3, Differentiation, 3.4, The Chain Rule, and we're on the bottom of page 156, the general power rule. Okay? It's one, I don't know if I want to say one of the most common types of composite function. It is a common type of a composite function. The rule for differentiating such a function is called the general power rule, and it's a special case of the chain rule. Okay? And here's how I like to think about it. If you like to think about it in a different way, fine. Okay? It works several different ways. But when I look at this, I see first a function being raised to the nth power. So I'm going to differentiate that first. It would be n times the same function, whatever that u of x is, to the n minus 1 power. Right? That's the power rule part. The chain rule part then takes you and take the second step, multiply it by the derivative of u. Okay? Now, some people like to take the root of the inner part first and then do the outer part, n times u of x. The thing to remember with the chain rule is that u of x, you don't change the u of x. You take a derivative of it on the outside, but don't change it on the inside. Okay? Take the derivative of n times u of x raised to the n minus 1, and then take the derivative either before or after that of u. Okay? Uh, the rule for differentiating that, yeah, okay. 
Let's see if they'll give us some examples. Oh, they're going to show us how they say that in the theorem. Okay? If y is equal to u of x raised to the nth power, where u is a differentiable function of x, and n is, guess that, it's not an integer anymore, it's any rational number. Frankly, it could be an irrational number, but we're not going there yet. Any rational number. Okay, then dy dx of the innermost variable there, okay, is n times u of x. Don't change that inner function here. n times u of x raised to the n minus 1, then turn around and take the derivative of the inner part, du dx. And if you want to do that du dx first and then take the derivative out, in outer part, that's fine too. Or equivalently, here's how they say it, d by dx of u to the n, now they've left off some of the parentheses and variables, be n times u to the n minus 1 times the derivative of u. du. Now, it sort of writes me a little bit, they mix up their notations. If you're using d by dx here, why don't you put du dx here, just like you did there. There's no special reason to change that to u prime. It's perfectly correct. You could have put a u prime up here too. Why mix your notations? I don't know. But that's the general power rule. Any questions on that? Perhaps the questions will come if we do an example. And here's example four. So I want you to tell me what you think f prime of x should be. Where would you begin? And there's not just one place. There's a couple places you could begin. Where would you do it? Okay, you're going to start with that one and what you're going to do with it. You want the derivative of the inner function first. That's a legal thing to do. What would that be? Three. No, not three x. Okay. If you're taking the derivative of the inner, then do that. If you're taking the derivative of the outer, you would do leave it three x. So which way are you doing? Oh, you're taking the outer. That's fine. Okay. Is that three then probably is in front? And what goes inside? Three x minus two x squared to the second power are you through? Please say no. Okay, what else are you gonna do? times times what? Help me somebody, I'm drowning up here. In this kind of weather that's easy to imagine. Okay. It's what? I can't hear. And what is the derivative of the inner function? Three Did I hear a minus? Please say yes. Yes, minus. Uh eh? derivative. Four X. Got it. Okay. That's it. That's your L prime. Now, there's no real reason to write it this way, but you could rearrange the terms to be 3 times 3 minus 4x. That's an ugly 4 times 3x minus 2x squared squared. Okay. 
There's no reason to expand the 3 minus 2x squared by squaring it, then multiplying through. Leave it just like that. Let's see what form they left it in. They left it in the first form. Just this right here. Perfectly fine. Okay? Perfectly fine. But, <laughs> if you were doing web assign, they only want one answer, and even though there might be three or four correct answers, they would say only one is right. That one is a correct answer. The next one's a correct answer. You could have multiplied the three by the linear term, and that would have been okay, but you don't multiply it by the quadratic term because you would have to first take the square of that term. So, let's see if I can clean that up. <laughs> Wrong thing cleaned up. Okay. actually the first way is how they left it. Does that make sense? Okay. The outermost function was your cubing function. So you take the derivative of that. 3 times 1 from the inside and reduce that by 1. That's that part. Then you turn around and take the derivative of the inner part. 3 minus 4x. Make sense? Like I said, you could have started with taking the derivative of the inner part first. That's what I thought he was doing to begin with. 3 minus 4x times, then do the derivative of the outer part, 3 times this. That works fine, too. But this both gives you the same result at the end. Any questions on that? All right. Let's see how they did it. I imagine it's fairly similarly, but let's see. They, oh, they said let u be 3 minus 3x minus 2x squared, which is perfectly fine. If you see it better by breaking it down this way, break it down. Okay, no problem. Then what you have here is f of x is equal to 3 minus 2x squared cubed, which would be u, because u is at 3 minus 2x squared cubed. And by the general power rule, that would, the derivative of that would be... 3u squared. But then plug in what u is, what u are, and that's this. Okay? But then you take the derivative of u, which is what I was pulling teeth trying to get you to do there, and y'all did it. Okay? And that gave you that. Which you can do from there. 3 times what's inside that, reduce that by 1, then times the derivative of what's inside. Okay? To me, by writing all this stuff down, which is perfectly correct, if you see it better writing it down, write it down. If you see it okay, just doing what it says to do, then just do that. Don't ever forget to take the derivative of the inner part. That's where the chain rule will tend to reach out and trip you sometimes. Any questions? All right. Whoa! There are skipping examples. Five and six. Yeah. So let's go back and do example five. All right says, find all points on the graph of this, f of x, is equal to the cube root of x squared minus 1 squared, for which f prime is equal to 0. And those for which, I don't usually don't write all this out, but I'm going to on this one, because for which f prime does not exist. Okay? So we're looking for two things. One, where the first derivative is 0. The other, where it doesn't exist. Okay. What would be your very first step to writing this problem? 
Okay, I agree 100%. How would you rewrite that? Two-thirds power. Fantastic. Okay? Now, with it in that form, it's far easier to take a derivative. So let's do it. Alpha prime of x, because this is your alpha of x. You just rewrote it here. What would alpha prime be? Two over three, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Times x squared minus one. To the negative one third, excellent, times isn't there another times there? Two X, okay. The inner part, derivative of the inner part. Perfect. Okay, now simplify that just a little bit. Here you have a 2 in the numerator, there you do. So that would be 4x, or 4 thirds x, however you want to say it, times x squared minus 1 to the minus 1 third power. Now, do any of you have a real big hankering to write that back in a form similar to what it started with? Oh, you don't. Okay. You don't see it a little better that way? I'll put it that way both ways so you can have make your own mind up, okay? In the numerator, we have 4x. In the denominator, we have a 3. And then we also have, because of that minus sign, you have the cube root of x squared minus 1. Now, you didn't have to go that far. You could have left this. Put this down here with the one third outside of it, positive one third, whichever way you like better. Okay. Now, the question is, what you wanted to find was all the values of x for which f prime was zero. That's pretty easy. Okay. And frankly, fortunately, this form probably is a little easier to see that. Okay. When is that form equal to zero? What value of x will make that equal zero? When is a fraction equal to zero? When the numerator is zero. So that's going to be when 4x is equal to zero. When is 4x equal to zero? When x equals zero. So there's your answer to the first part here. f prime of x is equal to 0 when x equals 0. Or in other words, shorthand way of writing that, f prime of 0 is 0. When x is equal to 0, the derivative is equal to 0. That means you're going to have a horizontal tangent line when x equals 0. Whatever the graph of this thing looks like, that's what you're going to have. Okay, but the next thing says then those values of x for which f prime doesn't exist. Now, where would this thing not exist? There are at least three places that you investigate for non-existence. What are they? What can you never do? About three or four different things. Okay, we sure would like that. What would make that happen? Okay. In other words, if x uh, how would you get an imaginary number down there? If that were a square root, that would produce an imaginary number. This is a cube root. That doesn't produce imaginary numbers. Okay? So you, that's one thing off our list we don't have to worry about. We don't have to have what's inside the radical be greater than or equal to zero because that radical has an odd index, three. That is an even index, yes, that would be a big concern. 
this is an odd index, so no imaginaries in our denominator, or anywhere else, by the way. So that one's out of the picture. Anything else that we've got to avoid? That's a good observation. It just didn't apply to this problem. Say again? Two-thirds being a negative number, I did Okay. I'm almost guessing that's sort of the same thing he was talking about. So I, I may be wrong on that. What other thing besides negatives and radicals, only if the radical has an even index, that's certainly something we avoid. So that produces complex numbers in here. Well, complex numbers anywhere. But we don't have that because we have an odd index. So you, that's no sweat. But what is the other? There are two other things that we try to avoid. Negative numbers inside a radical where the index of the radical is even. But this is odd. So that's out of the question. What are the other two things we try to avoid? Say again? Yes, you can't ever divide by zero. Now, what would make that denominator zero? Certainly, three will never be zero, so that's not an issue. What's the other thing we avoid here? What's this? Is it because the cube root of zero is zero? Okay. So what we have here is that x squared minus one cannot equal zero. If that was a square root, we'd have it can't be negative. But that's not, okay? Actually, we'd say it has to be greater than or equal to zero. It's not. That's a cube root, so we're fine. But it still can't be zero. What would you do with that? What's the F word? Factor. Can you factor x squared minus 1? Why would that factor? X, X what? Plus 1 times X minus 1. That product cannot equal 0. Well, if the product can't be 0, that means neither one of those could be 0, right? So either X plus 1 cannot equal 0, not or, but and X minus 1 cannot equal 0. What's the answer to the first one? Come on now. Yes, x cannot equal negative 1. And over here, x cannot equal positive 1. There we have two values of x where the f prime would not exist because we'd be trying to divide by 0. Now, the third thing we consider concern ourselves with, I said there are three. One is a negative number in a radical with an even index. We didn't have that here. Second was zero in the denominator. Yes, we have two possibilities that make zero in the denominator. Anyone know what the third one would be? This actually sort of has two parts to it. A log cannot have whatever is inside the parentheses of a log, has to be positive. It can't be zero, it can't be negative. We don't have any logs here, so we're not worried about those at all. But that's the three things to consider. Radicals, if they have an even index, what's inside the radical cannot be negative. Has to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay? Secondly, you can't ever divide by zero. So whatever makes that denominator zero, have to disallow it. Third, Anything uh, following a log has to be positive. Can't be zero, can't be negative. We don't have any logs here, so you're fine. So here are the two values. Uh, when x equals zero, your f prime is equal to zero. And the second thing is x cannot equal plus or minus one, because that would make 
D because there L prime would be uh, does not exist. I hate using a variation like that, but I don't want to write it all out. Okay. Now, I don't want to draw the picture, my laziness here, but here is what this function looks like. Okay. The cube root of x squared plus minus 1 squared. The original function there. It looks like kind of a W, a weird W. First derivative is 0 at 0. You can tell that flat there. But at plus minus and minus 1, okay, the first derivative doesn't exist. Because that's a cusp there. And you have one derivative coming in here, another derivative going out here. One derivative coming in here, a different derivative there. First derivative doesn't exist there. So the gray graph is the graph of your first derivative. This one's going to negative infinity from this direction. It's coming from positive infinity there. Zero there. This is the derivative function. And then it's going to positive negative infinity from the left hand side, positive infinity from the right hand side. So yeah. <laughs> The graph of your first derivative does not exist at minus 1 or plus 1 because this is going to negative infinity from the left, positive infinity from the right, negative infinity from the left, positive infinity from the right. But here, the derivative is 0. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank goodness you don't have to graph these things uh, or hold up books either one. Okay. So, got it? Make sense? Yay yeah or no? Okay. Let's do example six. They left this one off as well. So can I erase? Okay. Differentiate this function. G of t is equal to minus 7 over 2t minus 3 squared. Now before you take, try to take a derivative of that, what would you recommend we do first? I would say rewrite it. You could, using the quotient rule, attempt to do this, and it would work. It works fine. It's just messy. Okay? So how would you rewrite the function? Second, negative seven times two t minus three. And if you moved it upstairs, you have to negative two negate your exponent. Now, can you take a derivative of that one? Please say yes. How? Okay, yeah, if you're doing a product rule, not necessary. Okay, you're absolutely right. The root of negative 7 would be 0. Therefore, you don't need to do a product rule. You could do a general power rule here with a coefficient. Right? If that was 7 x cubed, and you had to take a derivative, you just do the 3 times the 7, right? Well, here, what's your exponent? Negative 2, what's your coefficient? And what's negative 2 times negative 7? 14 times 2t minus 3 to the ooh, you just added one to the exponent. You're supposed to negative 3. Subtract one from the exponent. Remember, that's the rule. Just because it's a negative number, it still goes in the other direction. It's subtracted. And then what? Huh? 
times what? Don't ever forget about your inner part. What's the root of the inner part? It's pretty simple. Two. Okay, that's it. So what do we have? 28 times 2t to the minus 3 to the minus uh, 2t minus 3 to the minus 3 power. Or you could write this as 28 over 2t minus 3 cubed. If you wanted to go back and write it similar to what it was to begin with. Either one of these two answers is perfectly fine. That's the time stop, by the way, because that's the root of the inner part. Let's see how the book got. They wrote it both ways. 28 times 2t to the minus 3, to the, 2t minus 3 to the minus 3, or, and they said it was simplified by writing 28 over 2t to the minus 3 cubed. Okay. Now, they tend to favor using positive exponents. Okay. It's not absolutely necessary, but when they say simplify, that's what they mean. I'm perfectly happy with the first result there. Okay. But the back of the book, web assign, uh, whatever, is probably going to be looking for your simplified form, which is using only positive exponents. Which then leads to what they're going to address next. Does I, do I need to leave this a little longer? Everybody got it? Okay. So what they're going to do next is simplify derivatives, which is what we've just been talking about. The next three examples demonstrate techniques for simplifying the raw derivatives, as opposed to well done, uh, never mind, of functions involving products, quotients, and composites. Okay, so now we're going to go back and review our product rule, quotient rule, and chain rule. So, let's, this is example seven. Let's find the derivative of this. Oh boy. What would you be your first step? Um, How? Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Just a hint. Don't forget about the x squared. Write the x squared down. It's not going to change here. Now you do the 1 minus x squared to the To the, to the what? Wait, what's that again? Where did you get 2 over 2? 1 over 2 to the 1 half power. The index, if you don't see it, you understand it to be a 2. So that's to the 1 half power. Okay. Now when you look at that, what kind of rule do you have? Say again? You do have a chain rule, but it's a little deeper in the problem. What's the outermost rule that you would have? Product rule, and then the second part of that is going to have a chain rule component. Does that make sense? Okay. So, how does first the product rule go? Uh-oh, wait a minute. That was a week or two ago, wasn't it? We don't need to do that anymore, do we? Yes? How does product rule go? Anybody? Help me, somebody. How does product rule go? I can tell you I've been doing all your homework exercises, haven't you? Hmm. That's why it's right on the tip of your tongue. 
How does product rule go? It's all right. Look back if you need to. You got your books open. Anybody even have a book? I was hoping some of you on your computer screen. Say again. Okay. Okay. So that would be. Give me sort of the product rule. Okay. Okay. Just in general, what does the product rule say? When you have a product to two functions, you're taking the root of that product. What do you do? Multiply something. What is it? The first function, or either one, times the root of the second, plus the second times the root of the first, right? That's what product rule says. Now, you can do it in the other order. You can do the root of the first times the second plus the root of the first uh, times the second. You can do it either way, but you've got to do a sum of two products, okay? So which way you want to do? Derivative of the first, and that would be 2, two x times the second. Write it down. 1 minus x squared to the 1 half, okay? Plus, product rule is plus, and what comes next? Okay. Okay. Now, if you did, I, I'm just being a little picky, but I, I don't mean to. You could start that way, but here's what I would say. You're going to do the root of the first times the second. That's what you've done. Then I would say plus the first times the root of the second. Just so you don't forget to do both pieces, right? So, what's the first? X squared, okay? You don't have to do it this way. I'm sorry, I say X squared and write 2X. There's something wrong with the old gray cells, okay? Oh, that's not pretty obvious, okay? X squared times, now what's the derivative of the second? Okay, there will be a negative and a 2 in it, but not just a negative 2. What's going to be derivative of that second part? Anybody? Negative 2x, I'll buy that. That is the derivative of the inner part. What are you missing? The derivative of the outer part. What's the derivative of the outer part? How do you get start? Help me, somebody. Say again? Where would you begin? How about power rule? What's your exponent? One half. I'm going to write it down. Times one minus x squared to the I feel like I'm in Thailand or somewhere and the Buddhists are singing their chant. What's that? Negative one half. Excellent. Okay. Now, I think there's a big parenthesis at the end of that. So, let's clean this up. I should have started further left on the page here. In the first part, you just have a 2x times 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. Not too much you can do with that, maybe a little bit. In the second part, that 1 minus there is going to change the plus to a minus. Okay? And here you have a 2, and there you have a 1 half, so those are going to 
divide away. You have an x squared times an x. That's going to be an x cubed. And I'm going to write it out this way. Um, ooh, it's hard to read my ugly writing there. Remember, that's a minus 1 half there. So I'm going to put the minus up there. Okay. So this is going to be uh, 1 minus x squared to the minus 1 half. Okay, now, <clears throat> that's a little on the messy side, okay? <laughs> okay, let's see if we can clean it up a little bit. One way is just this, leave this one alone for a while now, 2x times 1 minus x squared to the 1 half power uh, minus Let's put this one in the denominator, x cubed over 1 minus x squared to the positive 1 half power. Okay? By that? Okay? Now, you have a denominator. Okay? Now, would you all rather go back and have that in the square root, or are you happy with fiddling with it the way it is now in exponential notation? Which way do you see better, huh? Go back to one half. Yeah, let's do that. So this would be 2x times the square root of 1 minus x squared minus x cubed over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay? Now, since you have a denominator here, and you want it all over the same denominator, we could divide this one by 1 minus x squared, but if we did that, what would we also have to do? To not change the form. Help me somebody. Multiply also by square root of 1 minus x squared. Oh, square root of 1 minus x squared over square root of 1 minus x squared is what? And you can multiply by 1 anytime you want to. So I'm going to multiply the denominator by that, square root of 1 minus x squared. Since I already have 1 up here, I'm just going to square that. Right? Multiply it by it again, right? All right. Now, what does your numerator become? This is a 2x, and what happens to that if you square a square root? Help me somebody. And what do you have? 1 minus x squared. Okay. Minus an x cubed. That was left here. All over the square root of 1 minus x squared. All right. Now we got some work to do. Okay. That numerator over here. You can distribute the 2x in there. That would be a 2x minus. And when you do the 2x times a minus x squared, what do you get? Help me. It's just a simple distribute. What's that? Minus 2x cubed minus x cubed over the square root of 1 minus x squared. One more step. I think we got this knot. 2x minus, combine like terms, 3x cubed over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And I can't think of anything else to do to simplify that any. You could factor out an x in the numerator, but why? It doesn't really make it any simpler, okay? I think that's the answer. Let's see. Well, let's first see what they did. They did factor out the x. I don't know why, but they did and got x times 2 minus 3x squared over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Now, the reason I say that's not any simpler it's got a set of parentheses, and that's the thing that it is. 
To me, this is just as simple, if not more simple, than that is. So either one of those answers is perfectly legitimate. Okay? Want to see how they did it? Since they did it, I'm going to erase all mine. Any questions for our erase? Okay. All right. Is everybody still with us? Okay. All right. Missing any steps here? I'll be glad to go over them. Yeah. Okay. All right. The solution, they wrote it again. Okay, that's a good first step. Okay. Then they rewrote it in exponential notation, which I always prefer to take the root of exponentials rather than radicals. So that's x squared times 1 minus x squared to the 1 half. Now this becomes a product. And the derivative of a product is, and they did it the other way, it's perfectly fine, the first times the root of the second, that's that, plus the second, which is that, times the root of the first. Perfectly fine the way you did it as well. Okay? Now, in this derivative here, this is a power rule, one-half times this thing to the minus one-half, but don't forget the chain rule times the negative two x. So that's going to be their next step, whereas this one was our easy one, it's just two x times this thing. Okay? So, it'll be an x squared times a one-half this to the minus one half times a minus two x from the chain rule. Okay? Plus this thing times two x. Okay. So that's the same thing we did just in different order. Okay? And since this is sum, the order doesn't matter. Okay? Now we've got some fiddling to do. And part of the fiddling is I would suggest they're going to put this in the denominator with the two. Oh, they may just take the twos out here, and this will become a negative term because of that minus sign. This is plus, this is plus, but that's minus. These are all multiplied together, so that's going to be a minus. Okay? And it will be an x cubed over that thing to the one-half power or square root. And on the other side, just a plus 2x times that. So let's see how they did that. Yep, they factored out a minus x cubed, x squared from there, x from there, the twos cancel out, the minus came out here, this thing to the minus one half, plus two x, and just move that in front of this to the uh, one minus x squared, to the one half. Okay, let's see what they do next. Oh, what a joy. They factored out an x to the root. Okay. I cannot give you the reason they did it this way, but they did. They noticed there was an x here and three x's here, so factor one of those out. Leaving the minus to stay inside with the x squared, so that's okay. It's just strange. Okay. They factored out an x1 minus x squared to the minus 1 half, which is the same as dividing it by that, dividing this by that, which then moves in the numerator. Frankly, this to me would be a confusing way to do it. Every step they did was right, but boy, is that ever so not clear, okay? Uh, that left the minus x cubed, x squared here, because they pulled out an x, minus x squared here. Why they put a one there, I'm not sure, except this, that when you divided this out, this out of that, you left with a one, okay? Then you get a plus two, because they took the x out, doing so many bizarre steps at the same time. And then, when you factor it out uh, to the minus half, one half there, that would then mean you multiply by a positive one half here, which is not clear, but you do it, and that's why you lost the one half there. Okay. But 
but from this point on, it's pretty similar to what we got. And that's why they wound up with the factory form. Uh, they put the x over this, then multiplied it by this. Well, they skipped the last step. This would be a minus x squared plus 2 minus 2x squared, which is minus three, uh, 2 minus 3x squared. Uh, I almost wish I hadn't shown you this because to me, this is a really bizarre way to do this. It's correct, but it's really a bizarre way to do it. But that's why they wound up with factory form. Uh, they didn't just go back and factor, they did it. Okay. That was example seven. I have a feeling there's any questions on this. I'll be glad to try to answer if you really want to investigate that step further. Let's see. Oh, they're going to do example eight, too. That's good with them. What would be your first step on example eight? Rewrite it? How would you rewrite it? Say that a little louder. Put the x. Perfect. By x squared plus 4 to the except second except it's in the denominator that would be a negative one third power. Perfect. Now, how true? Okay. What does that represent? A product again okay fairly simple product but still a product so what rule would you use first product rule and how does that go help me you are real keen on the product rule aren't you Help me, somebody. You got it last time. Same product rule. How does the product rule go? Saw mouth move. Uh, didn't hear any. Okay. All right. If I'm following what you're doing, I could see a negative one-third x maybe, but not negative three x. Okay, let's just do it simply. It's this thing times that thing. That's the product, right? And how does the product rule go? It's what? Okay, derivative of the first would be? Derivative of x. What? Okay. Times the? X squared plus 4. Second? X squared plus 4. Yeah, the second. Okay. Which would be x squared plus 4 to the negative 1 third. It's the derivative of the first times the second. And you really don't need the one there or the parentheses brackets, but I'm leaving them there for now. Plus? Okay, it doesn't matter. You can if you want to, just don't forget about the x. Okay, negative one third. Okay, at some point you'll need that, and what would that be? Say again? Two what? Two x. Two x, okay. Okay. You still have another part left over from that negative one third. The part of the power rule you didn't finish. Uh, 
right, okay. You're doing the derivative of the second, right? You did. Okay, you haven't done the first yet. You got to remember to do the first, right? The first step. But then the derivative of the second would include negative one third times this to the power rule, right? Negative one third times this to the help me somebody. Huh? Okay, you subtract the one from this. No, that is negative one third. Subtract one from it, you still get negative one third. Okay, I owe you a third of a dollar, and I borrow another dollar from you, so I still owe you a third of a dollar. I'll I'll, I'll do that. Okay. And go home happy. Okay. You're subtracting one from that. How many thirds is one? Three thirds. So if you got a negative one third subtracting three thirds from it, what do you wind up with? Okay. You, uh, I owe you a third of a dollar. I'll borrow another dollar from you, and I only owe you negative two-thirds of a dollar. I'll buy that one and go home with it, okay? What you get when you subtract one from negative one-third? Second? Okay, negative three-thirds from negative one-third, that would give you easy. Negative four thirds, right? You subtract another three thirds from it. So that would be your x squared plus four now to the minus four thirds. Okay. Now this was done and we still got one more piece to that. And what was that piece we hadn't done yet? The first, which is the x. Okay. It's sort of did you write the book? No, I just started kidding. Okay. Um, if I were doing this, I would have written this as x. I would have done that out front. Times the root of this would be a negative one third times this, this times this. Then reduce this by one. It's already a negative one third. Reduce it by another three thirds. That gives you a negative four thirds. And then do the derivative of the inner part, which is two x. You did all the pieces. But in a really bizarre order. But the book seems to like bizarre order. So we've got them all done now. Uh, let's combine them. Okay? And this first one is going to be... Do you want to go back to radicals yet? Or leave it in exponentials for now? It's up to you. What's your preference, huh? Second? Well, which do you see best? Radicals. So this first one would be what? One over x squared plus four to the... Oh, wait, I was going to write it as a radical. And that radical would have been... the cube root of that, right? Just like it was here, right? So, that's the first part. Now, we got a plus here, but then it's followed by a minus, so it's going to wind up being a minus. Well, let's get our numerators first. The 2x is in the numerator, and this x is in the numerator, so that's going to be a 2x squared, right? Okay. In the denominator, we have a 3 here, and then we have and there's, there's a couple ways you could write this. 
the cube root of x squared plus 4, that's to the fourth power, right? That's what we mean by that. I think I've accounted for everything, haven't I? Yeah. You've got the minus sign here, the 3 there, a 2x there, and another x, a 2x squared, and then this is this thing, the cube root of this to the fourth power. Okay. Now, that's the calculus part, and frankly to me, I mean, it's not super easy, but that was easier. When it gets to the simplifying part, which is just algebra, that gets even worse, okay? Not really, but it's, it's a little. What's your least common denominator here? Okay, you certainly have the cube root of an x squared plus 4, but to the fourth power, okay? But you also have a... 3. Okay? Now, to get this denominator to look like that denominator, I've got to multiply by 3, and then I've also got to multiply this thing to the third power, right? Because this is to the first power here, fourth power there, so but that's just going to be x squared plus 4, right? Because, you see, this is one here, four here, so it's three more of these I've got to multiply here, but three times the cube root, I mean the cube root raised to the third power, is just going to be that thing. You see that? This is the three thirds power, right? Which is to the first power, right? Okay, so that's the numerator here, and over here we just simply have a minus 2x squared, because this denominator is all right there, okay? Now, we can do something here. What can we do? Distribute, and that gives us 3x squared plus 12 minus 2x squared all over 3 times the cube root of x squared plus 4 to the fourth power, okay? We can do one more thing to that numerator. What is it? Second? I wouldn't factor. Yes, combine like terms. And what does that give you? x squared plus 12 over 3 and frankly, I'm so tired of writing that. Let me just, I know they don't like it. I'm going to go back and write it this way. X squared plus 4 to the 4 thirds. Okay. That's the cube root of that fourth to the fourth power. I know they don't want it that way. Oh, but they do. That's what they did too. Look at that. Every other time they change it back to cube roots, but they left it in the minus four thirds power. Okay? Now, I can almost guarantee you they're going to do it some weird way. It can't be much weirder than what we just did, but uh, it will be something. Uh, can I erase, or y'all need it a little longer? Just for clarification, the product rule is essentially the derivative of the times the derivative. Wait, okay. The first hundred root of the second plus the second times the root of the first. That to me is the easiest way to think of it. Okay. The first times the root of the second plus the second times the root of the first. That to me is the easiest way. But if you like to do the first the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the root of the second, that's fine too. Just get both of them in there. There's two parts. One, you differentiate one and leave the other alone, plus differentiate the other and leave the one alone, okay? Whichever way you want to do it is fine. That's the, uh, the product rule, okay? But when you have a composite function, then you've got to do the chain rule as part of that. So can I erase or not? 
Okay. Okay. First thing they did was, oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> All right, they rewrote the radical only. Okay. And then they did the quotient rule, and my word, if you like the quotient rule, this way should just suit you to a T. I really don't. I would have done the product rule like we did, but this works too. Let's just review the quotient rule. Low D high, and that's exactly what we did, the denominator times the root of the numerator, minus high, which is X, times D low. The denominator, which is one third of x squared plus four to the minus two thirds times two x minus x times one third x squared plus four to the minus two thirds times two x. That's the chain rule part, right there. Over the denominator squared. So the denominator was x squared plus four to the one third. Squaring that is x squared plus four to the two thirds. Okay. So what you have now is this part has a cube root in the numerator. We're going to leave that alone for now. And this part has this in the denominator, and you already had that in the denominator, so you wind up with four thirds down here. Okay? And this gave you a two thirds x squared. Okay, so let's see how that looks on their next step. All right. <laughs> if, if you understand what they're doing, more power to you. I know what they're doing. They pulled out the one-third and the x squared plus 4 to the minus 2 thirds from both terms. Now, you didn't even see it in this term, okay? So what that meant is that you had to multiply this by 3, and whereas you divided, when you're pulling out, that's a division. You're dividing this by this, okay? which is this minus a minus here, which is plus there. So that's what gave you the x squared plus uh, the 3 from, from flipping that over, and this was from that. To me, this is the squirreliest way of doing this problem. Okay? But anyway, that gave you your new first term here. Minus, in the second term, you didn't do a thing to it except move things along like we said before. You pulled out the one-third here, so that's why that's gone. And you had an x and a 2x, so that gave you a minus 2x squared here. And then you factored out this over here, so that left you 1. That's why they wrote a 1 there, which is totally unnecessary. And you left this one here. All right, so I guess what they do next is move this downstairs to join that, making a positive four-thirds here, put the three in front of it, and you've got the answer. That would be the simple way of doing it. Let's see if that's what they do. Yes, that's what they did. No, they didn't. Okay. They did 3x squared minus 2x squared. That gave them an x squared plus 12. Okay. And then they did this part. 3 went down here, and this part joined that part and made it 4 thirds from the number. Same answer we got doing it with the quotient rule, which is fine, perfectly correct. Um, but this step here where they factor that out, that is open to so many error possibilities. I like to avoid the error possibilities wherever I can. But that's their example eight. Let's see if they're going to do example nine. Yes, they will. Look at this. Okay. Now, example nine, you can also see LarsonCalculus.com for an interactive version of this type of an example. 
So what would be your first step here? And believe me, on this one, you have several directions you could take. What would you do with it? You will wind up, or you can wind up doing a quotient rule, but you can't at the very beginning. Well, yeah, you can kind of at the very beginning. Tell me what you mean by that. Okay. Here's a couple of things, okay? And maybe this, see if this helps any, okay? Let's come up with a new function. What you want to name it? F. Let's name it F. Let's let F now th see if this is helpful. And I'll put F of X, since you said that, equal to 3X minus 1 over X squared plus 3. Okay? So what we have then is Y is equal to F of X squared. Okay, is that a helpful way to start this? Okay, now, I don't know if you prefer that form or F squared of X. Do you have a preference? Okay, all right. What we're wanting to do is take a derivative of it, right? Uh, they don't tell you that, but that's what we're doing. So what would be y prime? 2 times alpha of x times chain rule alpha prime of x. Perfect. Perfect. Okay? So, what you might want to do here is go up and figure out what L prime is. What is L prime of X? Now, here is the place where you could use the quotient rule if you wanted to. Is that what you wanted to do when you said quotient rule? Is this what you're looking at? In a sense, yes, if you rewrote this this way. If you rewrote this as... 3x minus 1 times x squared plus 3 to the minus 1. There you can use the product rule and a power rule, or you can just use the quotient rule. You want to use the quotient rule. Okay, how does the quotient rule go? We'll just forget this part. How does it go? Low, which is x squared plus 3 which is 3, excellent. What's next? Minus high, which is high, okay. 3x minus 1, which would be 2 what? 2x. Perfect over... Fantastic. Okay? So, you almost, ha you have the calculus part of the problem almost done. That would be 2 times your alpha of x, which is 3x minus 1 over x squared plus 3. Because so that's what you said alpha of x is going to be, right? <coughs> now times your l prime of x, which is now... When I'm writing this down, let's go on and distribute. What do you have there? 3x squared plus 9 minus 6x squared minus 1 minus 1 plus is plus 2x. Okay all over x squared plus 3 squared. 
right? All right. Oh, my word. <laughs> okay. Let's simplify what we can. I'm going to leave the 2 outside for a little bit and have a 3x minus 1 there. Let's simplify that numerator. And what would that give us? Negative 3x squared plus 2x plus 9. And that will be all over the denominator, which is x squared plus 3 cubed now. Because you had 2 there and 1 there, so that gives you cubed, right? Now, I think I've delayed as far as I can doing anything else, and now I think we almost got to do this one you do have to multiply, just so you can simplify. So let's not forget your two. Let's leave the two there. So let's, it's kind of like distributing, it's kind of like foiling, but it's more complicated than both. Let's do first times first is minus 9x cubed, first times the second, which is plus 6x squared. Since I want to go on and do my other x squared term, let's just do second times first, and that would be a plus 3x squared. Okay. Still got to do my x terms, so that's going to be, this one would be a plus 12x, right? And I still got to do this x term, that's a minus 2x, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know where that came from. Do you? I added, okay. That's 27, right? No wonder this is coming out badly. Okay, plus 27x. Good catch there. And then you got a minus 2x, and then finally you've got a minus 9, right? Minus 1 times 9. Okay, and all that's over x squared plus 3 cubed, okay? And now I'm going to multiply by, by my 2. Now I don't have much room left, so I'm going to come up here and do it. Minus 18x cubed, and these two add to be 9, right? Times 2 is plus 18x squared. These two add to be a plus 25, so that's plus 50x minus 18 over x squared plus 3 cubed. Now, that's my final answer. Oh, no, oh, don't tell me. They didn't multiply any of those things together. They left it in this form right here without doing any of this stuff. That or that or that. They just left it right like that. That's exactly what they got. 2 times 3x minus 1 times a minus 3x squared plus 2x plus 9 all over x squared plus 3 it's cubed. Okay, fine. Uh, they said that's as simple as they want it, so we did it. All right. How are we doing on time? Huh? Time's up. How could that be? Okay. Uh, we'll begin next time at top of page 159, Transcendental Functions in the Chain Rule. This is... We're almost through with the section, but it's a long section. Okay, homework exercises. Any of the odds, 5 through 11, they're all at Calc Chat, 5's at Calc View. Any of the odds, 13 through 31, they're all at Calc Chat, 13's at Calc View. And we'll stop there because then we're going to get into the transcendental functions. All right. So we'll pick up and go from there. Good deal. Any questions? 
looked like it was distressing some people. If it was, back off, take one bite at a time, and try to follow through. If you need a little more, a few more steps added to it, we'll do that. Okay. One more time. One more time. Yeah. First time through to the second, plus the second time through to the first. To me, that's the easiest way to remember. Okay. Yeah, you got the low D high as the quotient rule, which was, to me, more complicated than the product rule. You got that down, but the product rule is just simple. First, first D second plus second D first. Okay, or okay. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I didn't show the answer. I'm going to page through this real quickly so before I delete it. I forgot they had this one on here. They did it basically the same way y'all did. They didn't just name it F, but they got all the steps the same and came out with the same answer. Okay, good deal. Okay. That looks a lot better. Yes, sir. Yeah. And for this one, I'm actually, I keep getting four. You told me to sub in two, and I keep getting four. All right. Now, what, uh, what, what were you saying? I missed it. Um, I keep getting yeah. four. So, like, when I put whatever the answer, like, so don't put it. Okay, the limit as x approaches to a g of f of x, mm -hmm. where g is twice f of x, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be 2x squared minus 6, right? Minus 6. Well, if you do, it really doesn't matter. You take, well, let's say it may. Okay, yeah, your g says take whatever's in parentheses and double it. What's in parentheses is your f, mm -hmm. which is x squared plus 3, a uh, minus 3. So you're doubling that. That's what g tells you to do, right? Mm -hmm. So that would be 2x squared minus 6. 2x squared minus 6. Yeah, because you double everything that's inside the parentheses. So that'd be negative 2. Say again? That'd be negative 2. 2x two squared minus 6 would be negative 2. Plus two, negative two times two addition, the two is square root of two addition four. And then there would be six, and four minus six would give you a negative two. Okay, is that your answer then? Yes, sir. And then you said. Okay. You said two x squared mm -hmm. minus six. Did you write that down somewhere? Two. Two, 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 two,